Uh, today we are talking all about how to parent boys and what we get wrong when we parent boys. Hello, I'm Maria Rieger, your resident Gemini, and this is Positive Parenting with Astrology. And we have Kathy Imabayashi here with us today, who uh, has been living in Japan for a long time, but you are originally from Canada, is that right? Yeah, but you've been living in Japan for a long time, and she is the mom of a now 30-year-old son. So like me, she's the mom of a single boy, uh, and she has a really interesting multicultural background because uh, she's lived in Japan for a long time, raised her son in Japan, but also for a while, uh, you guys lived in the Middle East, right, when your son was younger? So he finished elementary school in Japan, and then his middle okay. high school were in Lebanon. Okay, all right. So what languages does he speak? Uh, English, French, Japanese, and Arabic. Some, not complete okay. Arabic, but he sure. can manage. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's amazing. No, that's, um, that's, uh, that's great. I think we talked before, uh, last time we talked about the benefits of giving like the multicultural background to kids. How that's yes. as, as educational as what they learn in schools. Exactly. Um, Hey, Kathy is a longtime educator. You've taught from preschool all the way up to business college. You've also been a school principal and you have really evolved in how you, uh, your ideas about parenting boys and you have a book and can you share the title of your book with us? Yeah, it's called Raising Boys Who Become Remarkable Men. That's right. And I've read it and it's excellent. And it gives a lot of food for thought um, because I think women have come a long way. We've come a long way in how we raise and educate girls. And th however, there are definite gender biases when we think about boys too. And kind of the first thing I want to talk to you about, get your input on regarding your book is you talk about, you open up by talking about the boy code, which is kind of a set, if I understand it, it's a set of biases and stereotypes we have about how boys are, mm -hmm. how boys behave, how boys should be educated. Yeah. So can you start out by, by telling us uh, what the boy code is, uh, how you define it, and how it is harmful? We'll go from so there. I first came upon the, the term in almost the first book that I read when I started getting into this, which is almost 30 years ago. And it was by uh, Dr. William Pollock, it's called Real Boys. And he does um, uh, male studies. He's got some kind of a male institute coming out of Harvard. So he had written um, this book called Real Boys, another book, Real Boys Voices, which was the actual um, interviews that he had with boys and young men and he he talked about the boy code being the society's set of rules so, the myths about boys that society pushes and basically he said there's uh, boys will be boys they should be boys and they're toxic and it's the whole concept of um there is a certain way for boys to behave. They have to be uh, strong, stoic, uh, always kind of at the top, the alpha male kind of uh, guy, um, not show vulnerability or the only real accepted emotions are those of, of anger. It was very, um, it is ingrained in society. And so people are reacting to boys and raising boys based on these, they become unconscious gender biases. And that's where the problem continues. It, it's perpetuated because of that. There's other work that's, that a few years ago, um, it seems that it's not the term boy code isn't as you know, out there as it was when it first came out in uh, the late 90s but I've heard it talked a few times about the man code mm -hmm. and so or the man the man box the man box and so people can if they want to really understand a little bit more about that they can look at either the boy code or the man box and you will find information 
that just make, gives you an awareness of how we are automatically reacting and the expectations we're putting on, especially our young boys, but not only, males in general. And if you, once you become aware of it, then you have the capacity to make changes. But if you're not aware, then you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. And you included in your book kind of a, a gender bias quiz that you can take mm-hmm. online, which was really interesting, which I took it. And um, I did I did pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I, I like, to, like to think so. So not perfect, but not terrible. So, but I mean, it is impossible for somebody to be 100% objective because we're all the, you know, the, the product of our life experiences. But as you said, if you know your subjectivities, mm-hmm. then you can work with them. And you have a really interesting story about when you took your son fishing when he was young. And that was kind of your aha moment about some of your gender biases. Could you share that with us? Yeah. I was one of those people who I really thought I didn't have biases. I was very, uh, because of growing up in the 60s and 70s, I was very aware of gender roles. And, um, you know, I, my first jobs were working with young children where we were of the, we were forward thinking and it it was neutral. So it was like, boys want to play with the dolls. That's wonderful. If girls want to be hammering the nails, that's wonderful. So that was already part of my environment. And I, you know, worked with kids for forever. So when I had a son, I thought, I kind of have this. Like, it's, you know, it's going to be an interesting experience because there are parts of it. I don't know about the 24-hour, you know, part of being a parent. But I know about kids. And so I was confident. Uh, and very confident about gender bias. I really believed I just did not have it. And um, when he was about three, we were living in Japan at the time, and his dad was working on a Saturday, and and he wanted to go fishing, and it was a beautiful day. And so we went um, to this little creek area that was a little bit off the road, down a path. Um, I didn't think about safety in Japan. I have never had that fear um and we were down there and we were having a lovely time he's got his little plastic fishing rod you know it would it was just a beautiful beautiful day after a little bit of time i could i noticed um that there was a group coming down this path and i could see that it was a group of boys and and my first instinct like truly an instinct there was no thought at all but it was total fear like guttural fear that here is a gang of boys coming down and how am I going to protect my little boy and myself total fear for that split second as the boys came further down you know it was obvious they were um, beginning middle school the age and I had been working with that same age group before summer holidays had started so more than anyone else again I should have known that these boys coming down with a, you know, long arms and legs and all gangly, they had the bigger bodies, but they still had the very young boys, pure hearts inside, basically. So it, we spent the afternoon together, had a lovely time. My little guy loved being with the big boys. They were just sweet, like sweet kids. So that night, I, I was thinking more about it. And I'm very analytical, and I need things to make sense. If something makes sense, I'm okay, even if it's not in the norm. But it has to make sense to me. And I kept trying to understand the logic behind my reaction. My reaction really bothered me. And I couldn't come up with anything. And it was really bugging me. And then I had a thought. When I couldn't come to any solution, I had this thought, and I thought, my little guy is three right now. So in 10 years, and then 15 years, and 20 years, is another young woman, is another mom going to be afraid of my boy just because he's a boy? 
And that just broke my heart. It was like, that's not right. It's just, there's something wrong here. I'm going to find out what it is. And that started almost 30 years of trying to understand how can that be? Educated, independent, um, broad thinking, flexible woman who has has done that automatically, unconsciously. I mean, it's it's a tough call because, you know, as an, an adult female, if you're walking alone on the street and you come across an unknown male, you're going to want to be vigilant, right? And that adult male, if they're, you know, a mature adult, will understand why the female, you know, is being vigilant, right? But Why? a young boy will not understand that the same way, yeah. right? A three-year-old, if that's how people act around them, or if, because as you say in your book, you know, kids learn by the parents' behavior and kids are extremely observant and they are always 100% of the time watching what we do, more than what yeah. we say, like you said in your book, that's 100% true. So if we are exhibiting that level of, you know, paranoia, I guess, they, they notice that. And the risk is that younger boys internalize that as like shame, because if they're identifying with, you know, their boys, they identify with the man or with older boys, and they're getting the message that there's something dangerous or bad or toxic about these boys, there's a risk that they're going to internalize that shame themselves and think I'm bad. There's something I'm dangerous. Right. And that's, I think what we want to avoid and it's tough. How do we raise boys to be emotionally healthy, safe <clears throat> men without suggesting to them that they should feel shame or, you know, not feel worthy in some way or they're without suggesting to them that they're inherently dangerous, if that makes sense. But that's what the boy code says. Right. Um, a few things in, in what you were saying, but I have to wonder, like, I know that there are the headlines and there are, you know, the majority of uh, violence is, you know, perpetrated by men. Uh, again, sure. often, not always, can be against men as well, but often right. against women, that uh, women uh, just physically can be in a vulnerable position. Right. Like, I understand those things. But there's also part of me that really thinks, why, why does it get to a point that that's the way a male behaves? I, like, just rolling it back, why is that even the way that we accept society? That, that that's there. So then if you go back to the very beginning and you have your, your little guy, even actually before the child is born, you start to associate characteristics and behavior and expectations once you know the gender, which is right. a very interesting part of how your you know consciousness works. But you have a little boy who begins usually, you know, the first few years, it's usually quite fluid between little boys and little girls as far as our expectations go. Um, then as that little boy is starting to grow up, he comes to understand there are certain things, if he does it, it's not going to be acceptable by the people he loves the most, whether it's his mom, his dad, his aunt, whoever. But that like, for example, the first time if he's learning to ride his bicycle and he falls down and he cries and whoever is there with him says, oh, come on, pick yourself up. You're a big boy. You don't need to cry. What that tells that little boy is that feeling that he has is not an acceptable feeling and that the, pe the person that he loves the most and he wants to be deeply connected with is telling him not to have that behavior and if they do have that behavior then it's making them angry or upset so that's not that's going to weaken their relationship so that little boy has to learn to put on a mask so the next time he falls down hurts himself wants to cry should cry <laughs> he won't cry because he doesn't want to 
lo risk losing that deep connection with the person that's really important to them. So if you kind of visualize that happening over and over and over and over again. So the layers of masks that that male ends up putting on for their entire life, there seems to be, you know, after a certain amount of those experiences and putting on that mask is that it becomes less their authentic emotions, their, their inner emotional world becomes more detached and they can't tap into what they started out with. And I think right. that's when you have the, the behavior that's really unacceptable and dangerous and, you know, all of that. But it's right. not, it, it's complicated. Right. But when you look at it as far as, you know, it, why should it be um, a culture where it's automatic? For a woman right. to fear a man, it's it's a given, right? Why yeah. why should that be our society? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a valid point. Um, I think there's a difference between we can take security precautions, safety yeah. precautions, right? Yeah. And we can, um, but but the other end of that spectrum is is yeah treat every man as if they're a dangerous, toxic person. Um, yeah, that's, that's certainly problematic because it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think one of the points of your book is like, we tend to accept and validate the emotions of little girls more than little boys because of the boy code, because boys, we think of them as, as you said, stoic as not showing any emotion you know, it's very triggering for me when I, uh, I remember my son's daycare, I dropped him off. And I remember seeing one time one of the daycare providers telling like a two-year-old, stop, like stop crying. And that was very triggering for me. Like yeah. why he's two. Yeah. He, that's how he communicates. I, it, and every time I see a parent tell a kid, stop crying, it's extremely triggering for me because you're yeah. invalidating emotions yeah. And you are suggesting that the kids should repress emotions. Yeah. And as we know, that is not emotionally healthy, as we say all the time on this channel. You need to be validating kids' emotions. And as they get older, they're able to more maturely articulate what they're feeling. Right. So I think some of yeah. it, too, is that we don't understand how, how our little boys uh, yeah. express. And I think one of the biggest drawbacks is that a mom is usually the first, you know, really deep connection. Like, you know, when they're really young, they're re that, that's the first deep one. And I think often as moms, we relate to our little boys from a female perspective. Mm -hmm. And we would not be treating our little boys any different, you know, we wouldn't be speaking to them differently because mm -hmm. they're a little boy. We're going to speak to them because we are female, but right. not understanding that there are differences in the communication styles, in the reception styles, in the thinking processes. Mm -hmm. When we don't understand that, then the expectations that we have towards our little boys is unrealistic. Like I can't imagine their world. Um, I can't imagine how confusing it must be sometimes right right I, and you've talked you discussed this in your book and i've talked about it before on this channel how schools um tend to favor little girls and i heard this from my son in his elementary school they always like the girls they like the girls more than they like us but he had all female teachers and the girls are able to sit down for six hours and they do not have the same physical energy needs as boys and I can't imagine telling a seven to eight year old to sit down for six hours and you get 20 minutes of exercise a day. It's, it's not, you know, it's not conducive to their development. And you also mentioned in your book that boys learn more when they get to move around. And I had a friend who the teacher was very astute and realized that the, the kid was able to retain information when he was standing up in class. So she would let him stand up in class. But that's exactly. a very astute teacher. Most teachers yeah. at least in my area, I cannot speak for all teachers. Most teachers 
they're, they want to, you know, control behavior to get through the material. And I'm not saying it's their fault. I'm just saying that's the structure of most of the schools where I live. Yeah. Uh, but that's tough. And, and boys have developmental needs. And then, like you said in your book, you start to see the differences in achievement because of the different needs. And then boys feel bad. That's one reason why a boys only middle school or high school is not a bad idea because the boys are learning at the same rate and maybe the teachers can make some adjustments in the classroom structure to account for the physical energy needs or they can get up and move around if they need to and things like that. And they're maybe they have better end up with better self-esteem because they don't feel falling behind the girls. So for all these reasons, and I mean, those differences are pretty well documented. We know that we know about those differences in physical energy needs. And I don't know if it's correct to say girls mature at a faster rate, but it, there are certain differences in learning styles. Yeah. Well, yeah. and the educational system itself is a really, really good match for a female type of, type of learning. Right. So, so right. that's where the issue is. You have a system that is really set up well for a female type of, type of learning. You have a, a system, especially in the younger years, that is predominantly female. So there are, it, it, it's understandable why little boys going through the system that first of all, when they first start, they are just kind of gobsmacked with, you know, you know, they're so excited to start and, you know, be a big boy. And, and then they just, you know, get kind of knocked down because they right. don't, it's that, you know, I don't know, the peg that's going into the, the square peg going into the round hole or whatever that phrase is. But it's a sad situation. There are changes happening, but it certainly is, is not, um, it's not enough. And right. to, to be honest, I've spent my whole career in education. So I understand that part of it. And I don't want to be bad mouthing it. Right. There is great room for change. And um, the pace of change is usually very slow in education. So that's why knowing both sides of this so well, I'm putting all my energy into parents because right. no matter what the school system is, if your home environment and your understanding protects that inner emotional world of your little boy, he's going mm -hmm. to be just fine. He's right. going to have to live in, in that world that has right. those expectations that puts him in that, you know, a stereotype of being the toxic male. But mm -hmm. if you know about it, and you make sure he knows about it, and in his home, he doesn't have to be, you know, putting on the mask. He will be okay. It's it's right. that that doesn't happen so often just yet. Right. right. That's an important message for parents that, mm -hmm. notwithstanding what's going on outside the home, you can still have, and you yes. mentioned this in your book too, the home as a safe space where you can ex be yourself. Yeah. Don't, there's no need for the mask here. You are safe. Whatever you say, yeah. you know, we will love you the same, right? doesn't matter what your behavior is. Your behavior can be unacceptable or not unacceptable, but whatever it is, we love you the same. It doesn't affect how much we love you and care about you. Well, and to and be able the, to tell him that when he's in, like when he's trying to figure all this out, especially in the, you know, first few years of education and, and further. To be able to say to him, it's not you. It's, it's right. the way things are set up. Because that, you know, th their self-esteem can take such a nosedive because yep. they're not understood. So if they know right. that you understand and you explain to them, this is where we're kind of lacking in education. Right. And this is where we're lacking. And just help him understand those situations that he will witness or that he will receive. And to help right. him process those, that, that's the kind of a, a golden nugget right, in, right. in having this information. Exactly. And not right. punishing. And we'll get to punishment in a minute. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because that's another great section of your book. Not punishing for quote unquote bad grades. Um, Figure out, you know, are you understanding the material? Are you learning the material? Do you need help with that? Do you need help with managing your workload as you mentioned in your book too like boys at that middle school entering high school age they do not have 
good impulse control, time management, productivity management. They just don't. That's how the brain is wired. If you can, I tell parents, if you can get through that and just try to guide them and help them without punishment, they'll be much more receptive to be set up. Because like you said, if you're, they're getting pummeled already in school and the parents, they come home and the parents are criticizing them. Now they feel just their self-esteem completely plummets. And those that's what we want to avoid. Yeah. That, those middle years and high school years, like I don't focus on those yeah. in the book. I, mm-hmm. I write about it. Um, right. But only because it was too much. I felt it was sure. too much. But that time period is such a, uh, like my heart goes out to the boys in that period of time because um, I don't think we, there's more information coming out when you start digging into it. But I don't think we really understand, truly understand about testosterone. And mm-hmm. I don't even think a lot of males they understand what it does to them and how it feels. But I don't think we have any idea of the challenges that our boys go through um, connected just with hormones. We, we have yeah. all this yeah. empathy for the little girls when they start their yeah. menstrual cycles. And you right. know, we, we recognize and we support them and we make allowances for the mood swings and you know right. all this. Right. But we don't do any of that for our boys. We don't understand it. That's why we don't do it. Right. And they have mood swings too during that time, during puberty. I mean, they they have hormonal surges and mood swings, and they could be sweet one second and angry the next. And as long as you, the parent recognizes this is a stage, this is part of the growth process, and can explain that to the child. I explain that to my son. You will feel some very intense feelings. It is normal. You are not alone. Everybody goes through this. They will pass at some point. They'll take a couple of years. They will pass. We will find coping mechanisms, physical activity, other things. But as long as you can explain that to your child so they understand, okay, this is part of the growth process. It's hard, Hard. but we will get through this. And this is not how it's going to be forever. But that's, that's important. Yep. Very, very important. Um, I remember listening to something, and it was someone who had um, gone through the process of transgendering from female mm-hmm. to male mm-hmm. as a young adult. And, and I listened to, a, I don't know if it was a TED Talk or whatever, but I listened to something that uh, he was saying. And he said the, the biggest shock was as he was going through this transition and he was um, having more and more testosterone uh, into his system, he said he could not believe what that was doing to his thinking. Mm. And he said, like, he, uh, he was just overwhelmed and preoccupied with uh, sexual um, impulses. Mm-hmm. and. He said, you know, same age, but, you know, a year earlier as a female, he didn't have those, but, and he also didn't recognize that was what it was going to feel like when you were actually in the body of that male having these hormonal surges. So again, it's a really exciting time for parents who really want to dig into things just to try to understand, just understand a little bit better. And and then we can help our boys understand themselves a little bit better. Right. Right. Which is why studying and being aware of childhood development is so yes. important because you yes. know kind of what to expect and you know it will not always yes. be like this. Right. This is a stage. This is a phase you get through and you want to get through it with the relationship intact. So That's can you before thing. I get... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And you mentioned this a lot in your book is that connection, maintain the connection and lines of communication open. Because if you, I mean, and I tell parents, look, you can, you can get educated on things like drugs or things like fentanyl, which is a big problem around where I live and other things and online stuff. And you can, you know, use whatever online monitoring software, but none of that's going to matter if your kid does not talk to you. Yes. It's not going to matter. Yeah. Because it's impossible for us to be monitoring kids 24-7. It's impossible. And and I have some in my some of my parenting support groups, the mo- it's mostly the moms are, you know, 
using these, uh, you know, blocker software or monitoring software and the kids find out how to get around them and then they get around that and then they get around other things and then they get a separate phone that they hide. So it's impossible to really monitor everything all the time. So you need to make sure your kids are comfortable talking to you, exactly. especially if something bad happens, because God forbid something bad happens and they just do not feel comfortable talking to mom and dad because they're afraid yes. of the backlash. So anyway, exactly. yeah, yeah, very important. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you, too, if you could share with us some of the physical differences or I guess differences in brain structure and communication between boys and girls, because you mentioned in your book, and this is new stuff to me, I learned um, from reading your book, that there are differences in hearing between boys and girls of a certain age, and also the the timed silence. That was a real aha moment when I read about that, if you could explain that to us too. With hearing, like, I'm not a scientist, and I don't, you know, I can't pull out, I mean, I could get you the the studies that I've picked it up from but what I, what I understand about everything that I have read is that there's a possibility that there definitely are some hearing um, differences especially as in different phases there is as as infants there are some differences in the hearing what they hear in their auditory okay. skills okay as they as they grow up, a lot of um, a lot of children, especially you know uh, seven eight in in that uh, age range, it seems that because of some of the hormonal differences, that there can be change not changes but you know like all of a sudden you kind of think oh you know he's not hearing me he's not you know there's something wrong and. And and I did that too, to the point. So I was one of those moms that I was getting so frustrated because I would talk to my you know son and husband, and I was starting to feel like I was being disrespected when they wouldn't respond when I was speaking to them, and and it got to the point that I was getting so frustrated with it, and it was impacting my parenting and my relationship. I decided that I would take all three of us to uh, get our hearing checked because I thought it's either how they're hearing or how I'm speaking. There was something. Right. And anyway, all of our hearing was fine and it started another road, but it gave me an awareness. And when I had read, you know, that it was possible during this, uh, especially during this period that there would be, could be some hearing loss in, in boys. I thought, okay, I I will follow all this up. Um, The biggest thing about the the hearing that goes with gender is that when, an example that I give is if you are calling your son. So say he's up in his room, he's come home from school, he's done his thing, he's up in his room, he's you know, playing with his Lego or something he's very absorbed in. You're downstairs, you're making your meal, you decide, um, you know, you're going to give him the five minute warning, you're almost ready, you call up the stairs, you know, Tony, dinner will be ready in five minutes. I mean, that's what we're taught what to do, give them the heads up before. Right, right. And uh, you go ahead, you're finishing up your stuff, you find you get everything down, and you call up, dinner's ready, still nothing. You still have a few more last minute things. You get everything on the table. You're, you stand at the bottom and it's kind of like, where is he? And you call right. up a little bit louder. Uh, dinner's on the table. Come on down. And you sit down at the table. You wait a second. You're expecting to hear him coming down. Nothing. You end up stomping up those stairs into his bedroom, hands on the hip. Listen. <laughs> If you can't come down when I call you, then maybe, you know, whatever. No Lego after school, no computer after school, whatever it is. But that's what that's what our reaction would be. Right. And your little guy turns and looks at you like, what, what, what? Like, right. It's just the, the deer in the headlights kind of thing. And what's happened is that, first of all, comes with the differences in how males and females speak. So... Mm-hmm the tone and level of our voices 
you and I can talk together and be very comfortable with the same level. Often, if a male is speaking to a female, often a female thinks they're talking too loud or they're shouting mm -hmm. because the volume and the, mm -hmm. the tone of their voice is stronger and, and right. louder. When we call upstairs to our son, first of all, it might, he might just not be picking up what, the, what, the, what it is. Like he's not tuned into that, right. that frequency. Or he's um, so focused. Well, that's the other he, thing. Yeah. Females, uh, females are really excellent at multitasking. Right. Any woman will tell you that. Males are exceptional at single focus. And I'm speaking in general on a spectrum. So that um, ability to totally tune into something that they're engaged in. So you imagine your little boy and he is totally focused on whatever he's building to the exclusion of anything else going on, you know, in his you know, peripheral atmosphere. And then you're downstairs trying to get in, not even on the same tone that he naturally takes in. So he hasn't heard you. Right. He really hasn't heard you. Right. And so if a mom, knowing that, knowing that they're up there engaged in something, simply takes that extra one minute, goes upstairs, puts her hand on his shoulder and make sure he's tuned right. in to Eye her. contact, yeah. And you say, come on down in five. And then that's it. Right. The other thing is that often we react first. We assume that we're being disrespected. We, you know, we assume that they heard us and mm -hmm. are not responding. And if we can simply say, whenever we have that feeling, if we first, and like really with curiosity, not with, you know, anger and, right. and judgment, but really say, did you hear me? It is surprising if they respond honestly, how many times they will say, no, I didn't. And right. if they say yes, and if you ask them again with curiosity, what, what did you hear me say? And you might be just so surprised. Like, you think they're getting everything that you're saying. But right. Sometimes you really need to check. Right. I, I remember being that way as a kid. I would just, like, my automatic response would be, yes. My mother also was a consummate lecturer, which you say mm -hmm. in your book not to do. And she would lecture, 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 lecture. And I would just start, I would tune out and daydream yeah. because, and, and then I, and then she'd be mad that I wasn't listening to her. Well, no, because you're talking for half an hour about, how yeah. bad I am or being yeah. criticized. So yeah, I mean, it's all the same stuff. So <laughs> yeah, I spend a lot of energy picking out what the information I really need to know from the rest of the superfluous yeah. lecture, which frankly was just to, for her to blow off steam. Right. That's a whole different story, but well, um, that's, that's yeah. actually a really important point with boys, especially yeah. the fewer words we use, the better it is. Yes. Yeah, I noticed that too. And he's more like my son is more apt to remember, yes. uh, like you said, and um, uh, rather than, you know, if I start to go off. But, um, and then yeah, can you explain what the, go ahead. Finish I, I your thought and say, I'll ask you the question. Go ahead. Well, I was going to uh, respond to the time silence. Yes, yes. please. Okay. So um, often when there's some kind of a conflict, uh, some kind of mm -hmm. emotional explosion, whatever it is, but there's some kind of conflict. The female version of that, you know, when there's a conflict, you, if you and I have a, a really strong disagreement right now, and it's going to infect, uh, affect our relationship, probably we will both say, or one of us will say, and the other will agree, listen, we need to talk about this. We need to iron this out. And we need to do it right now. Like we need to get over this. You have to do this right now. And we will both be able to sit down face to face and have this conversation and possibly work whatever the problem was out. It doesn't work that way with males. And it's mm -hmm. not just the little boys. And so as, right. a, as a 
you know, with a partner, if you remember this, this will save you a lot of, you know, both of you, a lot of turmoil. But when a boy has had some kind of emotional experience, and especially if it's something where he has really had explosive feelings or he's been in a situation where he's been shamed or embarrassed, those feelings are overpowering. Mm -hmm. If we try to talk to them and, you know, like, what's going on? You know, what happened to you? What do you think you're doing doing that? We will get nowhere. And in fact, probably worse because they will shut down. Right. Leave me alone. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Yes. And then we take, we, we're defensive about that response. Right. If we recognize that there is this period of time that he needs before he is capable of having that conversation with us, it could be like, and again, depending on the age of the child, but mm -hmm. say, say it's your eight year old and you know, that something has happened at school really bad. You've been called in to, to pick him up from the principal's office, and then you're driving him home. You're, and the principal has already told you what the problem is. You are fuming. Like, you can't believe that your son did it. He's in the back seat. He is, like, red-faced. He's, you know, he's on the verge of tears, but he's not going to cry. But he is just, you know, kind of back there he's mm -hmm. not coming shut down. down you want to you know as you're driving that 15 minutes home you want to understand you want to support him you know he's in turmoil you might not like what he's done but you know that you can support him you can help him and you want to do it now because he's in pain right so then we will try to talk and we will try to you know ask questions, ask for clarification, and he is not ready. And it will put up a bigger block, a bigger wall. And yet, if we can just give him that time, so say in that car drive the whole way home, like you might, I might say when I first get in the car, I'm really sorry you're having such a crappy day. Right. And then I probably would say nothing. Right. For the rest of the trip, absolutely nothing. Right. And then at the end of it, maybe get out and, you know, as he slams the door um, behind you, um, mm -hmm. he goes into the house and you might just give him time. Mm -hmm. Depending on what's happening in the situation, he needs some time. But usually what happens is that he might go into his room, he might, you know, whatever, to calm himself down, to mm -hmm. be able to start to regulate those mm -hmm. strong emotions that he lost control with mm -hmm. and when he's ready he will come to you if you like oh, yeah. you've got a good relationship and he'll yeah. want to talk about it and that yep. time you just have the most golden opportunity to guide mentor support because he's ready but right. if you try but most of us try to do that way too soon right and if we give the time and even like with, with an older male, a partner or something, when I have found from experience, if there's something really important that has been annoying me and, and is starting to negatively impact our relationship, if I try to talk about it right away, I'm not going to mm -hmm. get a good response. But if I say, you know, this weekend, I really would like to talk to you about this issue because it's upsetting me well the chances right, of, right. of us having a really good constructive positive conversation two days later is really high but if right. i try to bring it up suddenly at mm -hmm. the dinner table it's probably not going to work out well for me so it's a little right, bit right. different but it's that break between whatever's happening and having that right. time alone and then coming back and connecting Right. And that, that was a really important lesson for me. So I'm a very impatient person and I like to get, I want to fix it now, like you said, yep. right? Yes. Um, yep. But although as an introvert, I can understand the need to process because that's kind of how I work too. But I, I figured that out with my son, let him go to his room, 
Mm-hmm. And, and it's very important that kids learn to self-soothe, right? Yes. And regulate their emotions on their own eventually. Yes. This is yeah. part of it. Yeah. So if you don't give, let them have the time to kind of self-soothe and, you know, deal with their emotions, regulate their nervous system, you need to give them that time to do it. Yeah. So there'll be more. But they do every time. I notice mm-hmm. my son who's 14 now will come and talk to me eventually. Yeah. Right. But and I just kind of go on develop- with my you yeah. have developed that that connection right. and that relationship and your communication style from the right. beginning. So that's right. that's the result, a beautiful result. Right. right, right, and that's yeah. I'm very I'm very lucky that I clued into that early. Partly it's because his nature is so similar to mine. Like we're yeah. both introverts, so we get overstimulated easily. So if somebody is peppering you with questions, I want to talk about this now, you just get overwhelmed. So yeah. I. I understood that although sometimes it was hard not to take personally, yes. um, get a, going in his room and the, some, the occasional door slam, I just yeah. let it go. Yeah. And he always came out of it on his own. And that's yeah. important to learn yeah, to, you know, regulate your own emotions and come out of the bad emotions on your own. We can't always fix that. It's interesting. So years ago, between my first marriage and my second marriage, I took a relationship course. And it was taught by a man, but it was geared for women, heterosexual women. And the man said something that he said, when a man is, basically, it's what you said with the time silence. I just didn't know about the term time silence. Uh, He said, when a man experiences some intense event that it, it provokes like an intense emotional experience, whether positive or negative, he needs some like downtime to kind of process it and sit with it. And so if the relationship is new and you've had, in the context of a romantic relationship, you've had this, like, I don't know, really positive weekend with this new relationship, right? And then you don't hear from the man for a day or two, not to freak out about it because it's that process of needing to process and sit with the emotions and then he will reconnect with you. So when I read that in your book about the time, the time silence, I want to call it time blindness, it's not time silence. I thought of that course from years ago, and that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that is a male thing, which I didn't, I didn't realize um, that it was particular to males as opposed to like particular to introverts or something like that. So it's just another, it's another like communication difference to be aware main, of, especially when we're parenting boys. The main drawback, I think, that we where we sabotage things is that, or and that I did was yeah. thinking that everyone kind of thought and communicated the same way I did, like my, my males. Right. That the way I saw it was also the way they saw it. And that right, is right. just when we get to the point where we understand that's not, that, that's just not the way it is. Right. Then we can start having like real communication and, and respectful. Right. Right. Exactly. And um, obviously not all males have the same communication style either. And you put it out in your book that, you know, in contravention to the boy code, a lot of boys are more sensitive. Like my son is like that. He is not, he was not as like physically rambunctious as the average boy I knew. It's just not his nature. Like I remember he was like two or three and one of his preschool friends, they, uh, his parents had a, a baby sister and we went to a, like a picnic and we saw the baby sister for the first time. She was like a couple months old, right? And she was laying on a blanket and my son ran up to her. And I remember, you know, thinking I need to like watch him because toddlers sometimes don't know how to deal with babies. Right. But my son like knelt down, he was like two, two and a half. He knelt down and he just like barely touched her head. It was very gentle. He just knew to be gentle with this baby Nobody taught him that. We didn't have a baby at home. Nobody taught him, but he knew that's just his nature. He's very gentle and sensitive. And that's what I love about him, right? Do you think most, if not all, but most anyway, boys from the beginning, they have that. They have this Mm -hmm. empathy and compassion. They all have it. Yeah. They, they, we, we, do things that uh, yeah harden that up. That's possible. And then 
and um, one of the other things you talk about is that part of the boy code where parents, especially dads, will think, oh, well, you need to toughen up. You need to toughen up. Like one big thing I got was uh, from people, well, you, sh you shouldn't be sitting in your kid's room at night as he falls asleep. Well, you know, if he's six or seven or eight and wants me around, he has a need for that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's kind of, and I tell parents this is counterintuitive because, you know, especially in the U.S., our culture is we want to foster independence. We want to foster independence early. But kids need that secure base to be comfortable being independent. Yes. So you got to meet their emotional needs where they are for the particular kid so they have a secure base so they are comfortable being independent. Yes. If you push them into independence too soon, they're going to have a lot of insecurities and lower lower self-esteem, self-confidence. So Boys yeah. are often pushed way yes. too early to separate especially yeah. from their moms. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, you have to kind of take your cue from the child. If, mm -hmm. you know, they need some extra attention, it's something you just have to, they need it for some reason. It's like, that's an emotional need, so. Well, and then if you check yourself, and in that situation, that yeah. six-year-old who's saying, you know, will you just sit on the you know bed and, until I fall asleep, would you react the same if it was your little girl? And if you can say yes, then, you know, you're kind of, you're doing well. But often right. that will be enough of a check. Because kind of right. go, why, why am I not supporting his emotional right. needs in the same way? Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah those are important points. So uh, oh, I do want to ask you, you while well, we still have some time, about uh, punishment, which you rock, which you bring up in your book. And like me, you don't believe in punishment. I don't. I don't believe in punishment. Um, I, I think it's counterproductive. I think, like you say in the book, it inhibits connection. Mm -hmm. um, but could you speak a little bit to that? Uh, could you give us a couple of alternatives instead of, I don't know, uh, grounding or taking away like a privilege or something uh, for, as a punishment, what to do as an alternative to that? I put a um, a step by step thing in the book as far as yes uh, that very the helpful. process right um, when you view punishment actually I don't even I don't really talk about punishment but discipline right if discipline you right change your thinking about discipline and substitute that word for guidance like your role as a parent, is to guide. So, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things is that, you know, if you assume that your child is always doing the best he can with whatever the situation, whatever he has going on in that moment, then you will be a little bit more compassionate to whatever that behavior is. Um, mm -hmm. when, when he has done something, when there's been some misbehavior, that you know you have to step in about. In my opinion, the best thing to do is to help him understand, you know, do you know why this is a problem? And not to take the problem. It's kind of, you have a problem. Like, something happened here, and it's not, it's not okay. So you have a problem, and I, I will help you, you know, figure out how you can change that uh, to a better outcome. But part of it is being on the same team. You are there as the coach. And for some reason, he has done something. And often, he won't even know why. Like, he has done something. He has screwed up. Um, he knows he has. And if you punish him, it just, you know, um, disconnects that bond between the two of you. If you can kind of empathize, the behavior is, what happened is not okay. But if mm -hmm. you empathize, something's going on inside. And often the right. behavior is the reflection of some emotion or some chaotic emotion inside, some turmoil. Mm -hmm. And it comes out in this misbehavior. So if you get past that, 
the behavior part of it and try to, you know, help him understand uh, what was behind that. And then right. when, so for example, if say um, he, he has a fight at, at uh, school at recess or something and, and he comes home and he tells you about it. And, and if you ask him, if he can explain to you what were the steps leading up to it mm -hmm. and how did he feel, you know, not how did you feel about it, but more like what, what happened? What mm -hmm. triggered this? What triggered this? And when you're really curious about it and your role is to support and guide, mm -hmm. then you can help point out, like if you understand how to make sure your language is not negatively impacting him, mm -hmm. then you will be able to say, okay, uh, I, I understand what you did. I understand mm -hmm. your reaction, but the outcome is not good. So what do you think in the future, if the same situation, like you're trying to give him role modeling, right. if right. this happens in the future, exactly the right. same thing. What could you right. do? Right. And you involve him too in the conversation. In the process. Where it's not just a monologue and a lecture. You're involving him. I like to ask, do you think that was a good decision? You know, and I, it's a, without judgment. Do you think it was a good decision? Or well, do even you think you just could... switching that a little bit. Well, what do you think about that? Right. So it's not just yes or no, because he knows you exactly. want him to say no. But That's if, true. You, yeah. if you just if you ask him, what do you think about that? And then yeah. he's going to say, you know, I think I screwed up. I didn't mean to, yeah. to you know, cause that problem, right. but I did. Right. So it, it's punishment does nothing. If, right. But for example, if, okay, so you're sitting at the table, your kid is all over the place. You have reminded him, you know, that something's going to happen if you don't settle mm -hmm. down. And the glass gets, you know, mm -hmm. swoop, swooped off the table, crashes. Well, instead of disciplining, punishing, mm -hmm. if you can just say, whoa, didn't work out. Here's the mop. Here's right. the, like, and not with judgment, not with anger. Kind right. of, that was a mistake. You made a mistake, understood, but mm -hmm. now take responsibility. And this is right. how you will take responsibility. I right. will collect the glass because it's dangerous. Right. You will clean up the rest of it. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that they learn how to deal with consequences of their actions. But again, you're not passing judgment and you're not losing your cool. Right? And they want and, to. They want to make it better. Yeah. They want yeah, you they to do. smile again. Like they, It's interesting. Even older kids, they still want to please the parents. It's not always a parent. <laughs> yes. But they do, they, yes. they, and you'll get glimpses of that. Even with like adolescents and teens, you'll get yep. glimpses of that every once in a while. Very and you'll so. see the little kids still in there. Yeah. And you got, it's a good reminder. Like this is still a kid. Yep. They look like an adult. They talk like an adult. They have a deep voice. They want to be an adult, but they're not an adult yet. They're still Absolutely. a kid. Absolutely. So it's a good reminder. Yeah. yeah. That's a good, it's a good idea to leave the interview on is assume that your kids your boys are doing the best they can with what they have available and where they are developmentally that's a really good reminder they're not doing good it's because they can't do good right then right. so you know you right. you're just a little bit more empathetic and receptive and, and again right. the core of everything is the connection you have with your son absolutely and if everything yeah. that you do everything you respond with if that's the focus, and is this bringing us closer or is mm -hmm. it separating us? Then mm -hmm. that will also help guide you. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question to check yourself to. Is this action bringing us closer, yeah. right? Or helping us understand each other Yes. or the opposite? Yeah, that's, um, that's a really good, that's a really good reminder. Thank you, Kathy. It's really good. My pleasure. Um, and you, uh, Kathy, um, you're a Bayashi educator, author, and you coach too, right? I do, yes. Yeah. And where can uh, viewers find out about your coaching? 
Uh, the best place to go is the website, and it's okay. sunhood, sunhoodcoaching.com. And okay, on there, all the it. information about the book, about the courses that I have, um, social links. There's on the From there, you can go to my Instagram account. And on the Instagram account, on the link tree part of it, there's uh, three or four, anyway, um, freebies that... Okay. You know, if someone just wants to get, if they're a little bit curious, they want to dip their toes in, that's a good place to start. Great. Thank you. I will link, link down to that. And uh, I want to say to viewers, please check out Kathy's book. It's about a three hour read, so it's not a super long book, but it's chock full of good information. I learned new things I did not know before. So it is definitely worth the read uh, if you are a boy mom or if you have a little boy in your life that you would like to. Uh, nurture and maintain a close connection with Kathy. Thank you. Did you have anything else you want to, do you want to tell viewers before we close out today? No, just thank you for the opportunity to be able to talk about this and, and uh, mostly thank you for letting me know that the book had an impact to you because that, that was the goal. It was very much heart driven and, and uh, I really do want parents to get something, get something out of it that's practical, that will make that connection with their sons deeper. Absolutely. No, it definitely is helpful for that. I definitely recommend it. And I'll be recommending it to other, other boy moms too, because there's well, a special you. relationship with the boy and his mom. It's like, yes. that's one of the relationships he takes with him into adulthood as a model. And it's very special. So I would not I would not change it for anything. It's something yeah, really, really cool. Yeah. So thank you so much. And I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you.